This episode of Bass Freaks is brought to you by the MXR Bass Compressor. The MXR Bass Compressor is a powerful bass comp that allows you to fine tune your sound from subtle peak limiting to hard squash compression. It's a totally transparent comp to give you control over attack, release, ratio, input, and output. It also has an easy to use LED that allows you to meter your signal threshold on the fly. It's an essential piece of gear that no bass player should be without and is great for both live and studio applications. Go to jimdunlop.com and check out the MXR Bass Innovations Bass Compressor. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Dunlop Presents Bass Freaks. This is the place for all us bass freaks to chat it up, gain a little insight and inspiration, and definitely have some fun. I'm your host, Josh Paul, and today we welcome the very, very talented Mr. Steve Jenkins. If you are not familiar, he is an awesome bassist, uh, composer, teacher, a million other things. I'm sure that we're going to talk about in a second, but he is awesome. And uh, what's up, dude? Hey, what's up, Josh? Thanks for having me. I'm happy you're here, dude. How's everything? Uh, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Just, uh, yeah, just been, you know, trying to stay busy and, and it's been sort of a a mix of teaching and studio sessions and a lot of remote session work and stuff like that. Are and Do you... Uh, typically do mostly session work are you out on tour a lot usually well it's it's weird because um i do a fair amount of road work um i haven't been in la like a super long time uh -huh. so the current state of things like covid happening was kind of a strange time for all that because as of that happening i'd been out here for about three years so i i was just beginning to sort of get you know, get my bearings. And I had done a couple touring things, but it was definitely starting to um, get a little bit more momentum, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, typically that's, that's sort of part of it, like road work, recording, teaching the whole nine. Right um, on, man. Tell, um, let's talk about your history. Sure. Like uh, your journey, I guess you can say, uh, from, from where you started mm -hmm. um, playing music and, and to where you are now. How far back you want me to go? That's let's start funny. from the very beginning, the okay. day you popped out. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I I grew up in in the Washington D.C. area, and um, on the Maryland side, because you know basically the D.C. area could be generally it's either D.C. proper. People talk about Maryland or Virginia. I was on the Maryland side. I grew up in a town called Rockville, Maryland. And um, probably like a lot of people that have older siblings, my older brother is the person who got me into music. So um, when I was, you know, when I was really young, like three, like like three or four, something like that, I heard a lot of rock music like Van Halen and Kiss and Blue Oyster Cult. But I also had um, like a radio and I would always like kind of search for stuff to listen to. And I ended up listening to a lot of like disco and funk music. <laughs> because there was a radio station in D.C. called Kiss FM. And I thought that was Kiss's radio station. I was like, because, you know, they look oh, like superheroes. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, so it I makes thought, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I ended up hearing a lot of different things. And um, I was born in the 70s. So the 80s was like a very um, influential. How old are you? I'm 45. Okay. Yeah. So, you look um, a lot younger than that. Thanks, man. Uh, I'm going to credit genetics <laughs> and maybe <laughs> and maybe quitting cigarettes while I was still in my twenties uh, uh, for, for keeping that part intact. But yeah, I'm trying to fight trying to fight that process as much as I can. I guess uh, uh, I hear process. that it happens to all of us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> go um, ahead, man. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's cool. So, um, you know, the '80s was a huge, huge decade for music, and I, I guess a lot of the things that influenced my approach to music uh even independent of just playing bass i would say a lot of the like the musical quote unquote, quote unquote values if you will i think came from like just growing up at a time where you'd hear all kinds of stuff on the radio you know and and even things where 
things with sort of disparate elements would find themselves on the same song. Like, you know, like Michael, like Eddie Van Halen playing the guitar solo on beat it, like that kind of thing. Like just, Uh. you know, so, I mean, I think, I think that really informed how I looked at music, you know, just, just, there was a lot, I feel like even though there was a lot of variety in what was popular music in the eighties, there was a pretty strong element of musicianship. Oh, absolutely. That planted a lot of the groundwork for, uh, or a lot of, like it planted the seed in my interest in music. And and specifically, it's it's weird that we're talking about this like the day after, but, but Prince was like the first musician that really made me want to like study music. And the reason for that was, well, besides him just being amazing, I had the Purple Rain (laughs) soundtrack when I was in third grade and the end of the song Purple Rain, there's that string, that string part at the very end, which I yeah. think Claire Fisher worked on, but just hearing that really kind of mesmerized, it was mesmerizing and, and it made me really think about, wow, like that's, that's just amazing that, you know, that's how this album ends, like with these beautiful strings and stuff. So that's sort of what captured my interest with music, but it was always sort of there. And I don't have musicians in my family. Like I have music, lovers in my family like my my you know it was always sort of a thing but it wasn't i didn't come from some long line of musicians where it was just that's the family trade um you know for the most part the family trade would have been like working in news media so i kind of went in a different direction how did they um, feel about that what i i mean my parents were really uh supportive oh good great um it was it was definitely like you know like piano lessons were encouraged. And I, I did that for a while. Um, eventually after trying a few instruments, cause I did piano and then I played trumpet, but then I got braces. So that was an unfortunate <laughs> pairing, you know, like a, like a terrible, <laughs> terrible ouch, convergence of things. Ouch, yeah. ouch, ouch. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, it's like, you know, I remember feeling like I want to practice, but I don't want this to hurt. Yes. Um, so, you know, I had braces, but I never played trumpet, but I, I can just imagine I'm trying to picture it actually pretty vividly right now. And that doesn't seem uh, very comfortable. Right. Like that's some version of hell for someone, man. Like yeah. that's like medieval torture. <laughs> yeah. It can get there for sure. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, Why bass? W- was there like that aha moment where where you were just like, that's what I want? Was there a particular player or bass line that you heard? that you were like, hell yes, this is what I'm doing. I'm Give me a bass in my hands right now. You know, that's, that's an interesting question because I know generally, I think, I think for people of a certain generation, and maybe it's changed, but I know there's always the, the one story where it's like, well, everyone played everything and bass was the last instrument. I've heard um, that That often. no one was playing. Yes. I, that wasn't my case at all. I, I stumbled onto bass mostly out of dumb luck and ignorance because I really love guitar and I really love drums, you know, and I, and I play guitar and to a certain extent I play drums and I'm really into programming drums. So like my interest in those two instruments has never really um, waned over the years, but for some reason I didn't understand that like bass was sort of a good, good median point between both of those instruments. Like I, I had, it hadn't really occurred to me. It wasn't something I ever, uh, was told it just was something that I just I think in my ignorance is like a like a I think I was 12 or 13 when I got my first bass something like that in my ignorance I I didn't know any better and I didn't know that like there were players that had been exploring you know like different technical things I didn't know that there were people that played chords I just thought like I my whole thing was like wow I, no one's really messing around with bass the way they do with drums and guitar you know yeah and I think now, of course, everyone knows that's not the case, but like just being someone that was informed by the radio and MTV, there wasn't really a ton of uh, there. It, there Bass was definitely underrepresented, but occasionally, you know, you'd have like your level 42s and like, uh, you know, at that point, cult of personality was all over, was all over the radio. And I was like, that's a tough bass line. So, I mean, I think, but just relative to guitar being such a omnipresent instrument and and like drums it's just seemed like bass wasn't really getting the love that it deserved so i just was i like the idea of it being kind of an underdog um instrument you know like i was kind of 
kind of into the idea, you know, not knowing a thing about it. So I got into it and um, I got a bass when I was like 13. And um, I, you know, the first teacher I had, luckily was really good at teaching. And he kind of gave me the crash course, like, well, here's all the stuff you can do. And, you know, my head just exploded because it was like, you know, <laughs> the first time I'd ever heard certain things. But There's a name for this? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> but what's strange is there was definitely a lot of stuff I had already heard on the radio with some of these players. You know, like I had heard Shaka Khan with Anthony Jackson. I had heard um, like Prince. I had heard Brothers Johnson and, and Earth, Wind and & Fire. And, you know, so it's like I it's not that I hadn't heard great bass lines, but it was sort of bass lines in the service of like music that everyone loves. And it it sort of, you know, kind of sneaks itself in there. So um, that's kind of what got me going. And then I think like a lot of kids who get serious about playing, you know, I started really getting into like Rush was a huge band for me because to me that was like, that was a perfect way to get into songs with complicated parts. And um, there were things that technically I wasn't able to play. So I would learn Getty Lee's parts. And I remember learning like the bass break to free will before wow. the guitar solo. And then later uh, that little bass fill break he does on La Vila Strange. I don't I remember feeling like, you know, learning that was a huge watershed moment for, for just um, learning the instrument. And, and the fact it's not that I mean, it wasn't that far into my journey that I was able to sort of work on that stuff. And I think that just fed my curiosity and it uh, kind of um, pulled me in to the path of wanting to just get really great at playing and keep learning music. And just say it was easy, but it wasn't super difficult because I, I was able to see where the work I was putting was going. So seen by the results incentivized me to want to keep pursuing it and then i think i was kind of like well i kind of just want to do this for my job like this is what i want to do you know um so i got really serious about playing in high school and that was it like by ninth grade by the end of ninth grade i kind of knew i don't know how i'm gonna do this but this is what i'm gonna this is what i'm trying to do with my life that is awesome what so with getty was the, mm -hmm. which which line? I know you 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 learned that riff before mm -hmm. the uh, the solo, but was there a particular line that you heard or tune that was just like it captivated your whole uh, interest and and you were just blown away and inspired? Was there was there something about it? Was there one particular song, or was it just like the whole sound of of the bass coming out out front, which wasn't or it, you know, Rush, the bass is such a huge part of all of that music. It's out in front. It's like, you know, almost like the lead guitar. So right. is that um, something that drew you in, you think? I think, yeah, I think that's the one thing about the way their their band worked was that like everything had space for it for itself. Um you know, there was always like room for the instruments to kind of do what they did. I actually really loved his playing on signals, like the entire album. Like, I just feel like the way the, uh, the way his bass lines were, um, especially like on subdivisions, like there are those fills, but also just the way those fills would kind of cascade into like the next sections. Like I, I love that. I thought his, his bass playing on the song digital man was pretty righteous um, I, I think that's, that's the thing that really, um, I think, I think in terms of his, his influence, what, what I liked about his playing was like, they were sort of intelligent bass lines. Like they were, you know, like oh, it, yeah, it wasn't sure. so much the shredding or element of it, even though I, I like that. It was more just, you can sing these parts mm -hmm. and there's like little themes and, and they're intelligent. For um, me, for me, uh, the parts that you can sing. Yeah. are parts that are timeless. They just become the favorites. Even mm -hmm. even a drum part. If you yeah. can sing a drum part, you're going to remember it forever. Uh, guitar solos, like um, um, 
Neil Sean in Journey. You can right. sing. Basically, every single one of those guitar solos are, are vocal melody lines. Yeah. And that's what make them, makes them so memorable. And, and the same goes for bass. So I agree with you on that. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, I really, you know, I really dug that stuff. And then kind of after, sometime after that, I got really into um, fusion stuff mm. and, j- and jazz and funk. And I think. Now, were you th- listening? Um, were you listening to it or were you already um, with your lessons? Were you learning how to read? How were you? How are you easing into that stuff? Was it mostly listening first or did you just jump right into it playing? It was listening to it. Um, listening to it and sort of trying to emulate what I was hearing. Um, I didn't really get into reading until kind of by force. Cause, um, the thing about high school is, is I didn't go to like an art school where there was like lots of musicians. Like, so when, when there was, it was one of the dramatic things that was like a musical, I, I didn't get asked to play bass, I was told that I'd be playing bass <laughs> for the musical. And, and I didn't really know how to read, but I just knew that the amount of rehearsal that they were going to do for this thing, there'd be plenty of time to sit there and kind of make my way through what was happening. And a lot of the parts were, were quarter notes and eighth notes, and there wasn't anything super tricky. So by by the end of it, I was getting pretty good at reading. Um and then the teacher I had started getting me into reading like chord charts and stuff and just how to like approach stuff like that. And I wasn't like, I wasn't like, it wasn't like gangbusters right away, but I got very comfortable with the idea of like just looking at a page and marking the time by counting and stuff. I still would say reading, I wouldn't say it's my weakest thing all the time, but I think if I don't work on it constantly, if I don't try to engage it, it gets rusty. But um, I, I would always say f- I, I'm an ear player first. And then I, what I've had I am to as do, well. Yeah. Yeah. And then so how, do you find that like sometimes you have to go back and like figure it out and inform yourself, oh, that's what this sound is or like yeah. that's that's how this looks on the page. You know, well, that's, 100%. that's how I did it. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, it's for me, it was so much quicker um, to just do it by ear that it was yeah. frustrating to go back and have to, because it's almost, you know, you're, you're, you're becoming a toddler again, learning how to walk when you already know how to play and, and, Oh, I know what that is. I know what that is. So it was, it was really, um, uh, testing, I should say for me to do, but my grandfather drilled it into my head to be able to do it. But you're right. If, I don't practice it very often. I don't have to read very often, but when I, I do, you know, you don't do it. <laughs> you do yeah. get rusty on it, man. Yeah. I I just think it's ultimately the quickest way to remember things and it's the quickest way to document an idea. So I do it a lot in that regard. If I don't, if it's something that I want to make sure I can come back to and fully understand what it is. Sometimes I, you know, like if it's just a, like a baseline idea or a groove idea, I can, I'll just use voice memo. But sometimes like if I have more that I want to remember about it, like there's chords I want to put on it, or if there's things that are more realized that I'm not going to be able to just do real fast, it's quicker for me to just write it out. Um, Mm -hmm. And then because I've been teaching and I've been sort of working on my own um, curriculum, which eventually I'll have a book. Um, I've been doing a lot That's more. That's awesome. Do you have a title for it? No, not yet. Not yet. I mean, I think I'm trying to figure out how to like separate some of the concepts. So it's a few books versus just like one giant compendium of things. Okay. Cause I, th- I think people like the digestible element of stuff and it's, it's less daunting, but, yeah. um, if it yeah. has pictures, I'm definitely in. <laughs> Oh, cool. <laughs> I like picture books. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like, you know, it's really humbling to to kind of take a, a phrase that you know you've gotten a lot of mileage out of, or you know, there's things that someone can get from like checking it out to, you know, in, in terms of just finding insight if they want to figure out kind of like how you do something. Like to sit there and actually like figure out how is this supposed to look? You know, how does it 
how do I notate this correctly? Like, what's the best way to, you know, I also, um, I, for some of the things, cause I've been teaching this, this course on advanced techniques at LA college of music. Like I've oh, been cool. using tab two only to indicate fingerings because I think that's part of it. It's like, well, here's an easy way to play. Here's how I do it. So here's where you should be shifting if you're trying to do it, you know, the way I do it. And I, I think there's a, there's a, it's not necessary, but at least to give people an idea of like, here's a technical idea behind, you know, what the left hand supposed to do on this phrase. Um, so it's not as intimidating as it might look, but then I also respect people who don't care and figure out their own way. You know, how long, have you, how long have you been teaching? Um, at like at the school or just in general, just generally. Oh, okay. I've been teaching lessons in some capacity since like the mid nineties. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I like it a lot. The ultimate is when the student becomes like, I guess, metaphorically like a self-watering plant. Like they, they, they start to see the results of the time that they put in and they're kind of self-sufficient on their journey. And then I'm more of like a coach. It doesn't mean I work less, but it means that like there's a certain amount of autonomy they achieve where they can just come in and we can like play music and I can give them like probably the, cause I think the, the real, the real difficult part, I don't know, like if you'd agree with this or not, but I think like the real difficult parts of playing an instrument, sometimes it's not like the obvious things like, you know, use this technique or, or, uh, you know, use, use this particular set of notes to address the chord. Sometimes it's more like, Hey, like watch your articulation or watch how long you hold this note or don't hold this note for. Um, because that, that affects that changes, how everything feels. That changes it all. Yeah. It can yeah, change and it a I, lot. I really think those are the things after a certain point, like, you know, if everyone's kind of on the same, in the same place harmonically and they can play, that's like, there's that part, but then it gets more, um, people start to drop off when it gets into like note length, um, what's your tone like here, you know, like, like the, the intangible things that, that don't really, you don't get them, you, you don't really achieve these things by like giving yourself eight hours in a room. It's like, you get it from like listening and it's like, okay, this bass line I like on this reggae song, like Aston Family Man Barrett, he held that note as long as he possibly could before it went into the next measure. You know I mean? Like stuff like that, where yeah. it's like, I think that's the, that kind of stuff, that kind of listening. How do you, you, how would you um, recommend that people practice that? I know one of the things that has helped me tremendously, even now I still practice it, is just having um, a recording setup available, even if it's just GarageBand or something like that. And, and it is uh, accessible to, to so many different people now, which is awesome. But yeah. I, I'll just record some playing, even if it's, you know, 16 bars of a simple line and listen back to it and see where I held the note too long or right. not enough time and see how it changes the groove. But how, how would you recommend people practice that? Well, I, I think there's two ways. And one of those ways is what you were saying just now. Uh, Cause I think that's the thing, ultimately being able to play into, into like an interface and, uh, record your stuff into a DAW and then be able to see where the waveforms line up that stuff. I mean, like, let's assume everyone's got like a decent enough setup where there's no latency, but, and they can play, you know, and, and it's reacting the way they want it to react. So let's provide like all the technical stuff is in play. Those things are not going to lie as far as like where stuff happens, yeah. you know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. I've definitely become like a better musician understanding like where, you know, like how to pinpoint things that, um, you know, maybe, maybe I need to like consider this more like lean back here or like, you know, I think all of those things I definitely, ha I know for me, I've benefited from doing that exact thing, like playing into a computer and then even trying weird stuff. Like, uh, you have to be, I think people have to be willing to go the extra mile with stuff like this, where it's like, okay, let's say, there's a tempo you're really comfortable at. Like, let's say it's like, I don't know, like 118. What's it feel like at 115? 
what's it feel like at 121? You know, because that's the thing. Ultimately, there's like weird inconsistencies like we all have sometimes. Like you can feel you can sometimes do that thing where you play and you hear yourself adjust like in like maybe the span of two beats. Um, so I, I think like that kind of stuff is invaluable. And I think ultimately any kind of self-recording um, is is also invaluable because like if people were going to be out on gigs, like let's just say we're in a we're in a place in time where people are playing gigs again. I think that's the u- ultimate thing. Also, like if people just have a way to record what they're doing and give themselves enough space to to have objectivity when they're listening back. I think th- that's really valuable. But then the other thing is, I think listening to music just as a listener and not having the instrument anywhere nearby or having any musical instruments nearby you're just listening with your ears so just those as your instruments and just trying to like focus in on something i think that's where a lot of that stuff clicks you know Um, that's a great point it's almost like a yeah it's like a passive way of studying it but it ultimately comes back to uh comes back to like i think the way i think sometimes like being able to hear hear whatever it is people are doing um, and maybe trying to track something as like a listener versus like a bass player. That's helped me out too, you know, cause it's like, it breathes differently. Like if I'm thinking about being a bass player, sometimes it doesn't help my, my, uh, my, my approach to recording something. But if I'm trying to look, listen to it, like we're just listening to a tune and I just have to be playing bass while we're listening to this tune, that, that kind of thing, can give me like a different um, perspective on it. But I, anyway, I think encouraging people to mess around with recording and like try stuff. I think that's the number one, that's probably the number one thing that would give people the quickest insight. You know, I, I agree with you, man. Um, experimentation is key. Um, yeah. I've, I've been able to do so much more just by not worrying about if it's right or wrong. Yeah. Um, personally. So that is helped, but you really just got to get in and, and work, do it. Right. Um, let's see. Let's t- how, what is your approach to, uh, say, a line? You know, you're doing a session, you're in a session or on one of your records and uh, you hear a groove or you hear, hear the tune. How do you approach it? Um, well, I mean, I think... I'm a very drum centric bass player in that. I like, thought I you always... just, I seriously thought you just said I'm a very drunk bass player. Oh yeah. But... No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, <laughs> listen, man, I, I think there's no wrong approach as long as nobody's driving and, and nobody gets hurt. But no, I, I I'm very like, I'm, I get very focused on the drums. And so, um, like I try to listen to what the drums are doing. And then I think the second part, which is not not a far second part like it's probably like like this it's staggered but not by much i try to think about um if i can hear something that can weave a line through everything that's happening so if i if i got the rhythm idea kind of dialed in then i'd probably also want to know what the harmony is going to be and then i also want to know how long the phrases are and that could definitely have a big effect on the kind of thing I play, because if I have four bars to develop an idea, then I'm going to approach it way differently than if it's like, okay, chords move around and it's more about just keeping a constant feel and addressing the harmony. So I think, I think it sort of, um, it, it just depends on like what, what the situation is. Sometimes if it's just a complicated part that needs to be executed, because I get calls for that kind of stuff sometimes, Um, Then it's just you mean you mean um, basically just copying what they what's already there. Yeah, copying what's already there. Performing a part. Yeah, performing a part. Okay. Um, Then I try to think about if if it's if the creation of the part is not my responsibility as much as just the execution of the part, Mm -hmm. then it's more okay. Where does it need to sit? Right. And um, so then I'll I'll kind of like focus on that. But but I don't know. I mean I huh it's got to feel good absolutely yeah yeah it's got to feel good and and it's got to have the right sound but i think 
if to, to give a simple answer, I think my approach, I try to be as open as I can. Okay. And I try not to let myself get too married to the ideas that I think might be the best ideas. Like I might reserve judgment until I'm a hundred percent sure with what it is, but it also depends. You know, I think sometimes these methods are easier when you're in a room full of people. Sometimes it's harder when you're, cause I know I, we've all been doing stuff remotely. Right. So yeah. sometimes uh, it's difficult to know exactly what the client might want. So I try to ask more questions going into it. And okay. I think, I think there's, there's a certain value in getting instant feedback, but like from that kind of thing where if you're in a room with someone like, yeah, do that, you know, uh, yeah. like sometimes if there's not the, yeah, do that, <laughs> then it's like, <laughs> or, or on the other hand, oh, that shit sucks. Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse my language. Right. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, any kind of instant thing like that, though, I think is is really good because then then it kind of it gets you on to the next. That's but, almost um, that's almost like a um, live performance um, um, help as well. Um, you know, you you vibe off the environment and, and the audience. And um, I get that in the studio as well, you know, with a producer or with an artist or whatever. I do enjoy, however, um, doing some stuff like this remotely though. It's been very cool. It's been yeah. sort of freeing, but, um, yeah, I love it too. I, I love it too. Um, I definitely think there's a mindset. I don't know if you have, I mean, like, have you found that sometimes like you have to like step away from stuff like, because you can just like, you can like kind of drive it into the ground if you, if you do too many takes or, you know, like overthinking it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Cause I'm here. What do I got? I got the base and I right. got so much time of <laughs> without touring. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, I, go ahead, man. So what do you find yourself doing to fight that? Um, in that, in that situation? Like, do you create urgency? Like, do you do the kind of thing where, um, like I do, here's what I end up doing. And, and maybe a lot of people do this cause I've talked to friends about this, but like, I'll give myself, if it's not a deadline oriented thing where it's like, like if I have more than like three days to play something, which sometimes is the case, I'll give myself seven chances. Uh. And if it's not, and if it doesn't work, I won't touch it for like a day. Stepping away definitely helps. Even if it's just a walk around the block or whatever, you come back to it and you're going to to hear it differently. And sometimes you're like, oh, damn, that's it. And then other times you're like, you know what? I need to do this a little bit different. But right. I think it really just depends on, on the day, really, and what it is. So I was watching a few videos and... Mm. Um, crazy 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 technique that double thumb stuff you're doing is you know um oh, thanks no it, it was i was blown away i was like damn um but for you how do you figure out where you want to use it and where you don't want to use it say on your own stuff uh versus you know maybe a record you're playing on for an artist when well, when did when do you need that stuff personally? <laughs> the short answer is never, um, <laughs> never. I, and, and like, I'm not, I'm not shooting myself in the foot by, by saying that because, because for me, a lot of those things just grew out of curiosity and I've, you know, sometimes I'll do that stuff for the gram, but like, I, I don't necessarily get called to play like that very often, you know? Mm. Um, like I'm very, you know, it's one of those things where it's kind of just like, um, there's, there's things that like, I've definitely been able to garner from, from some of those techniques that, that have helped me in other ways. Like there's a lot of stuff I do with my left hand where I'll do like hammer-ons and pull-offs. And sometimes just when I'm playing and I want to have like a smoother kind of, uh, articulation with less attack from the right hand, 
um, it works really well for certain types of fills. And like, I'll use that all the time. But like, as far as like the crazy, like rhythmic stuff, I think I can tell you that like, there's one record I played where I used that stuff a decent amount. And it was probably some of the hardest music I ever had to learn how to play. Like it was like super technical. And um, I, I just felt like, yeah, you know, it was it was such a difficult project to finish. But um, generally, I don't, you know, like it's it's different because I've made two records, and the goal of those records has never really been to be like, here's what here's all the neat stuff one can do on the bass. Like, right. there's there's definitely one that probably, you know, if people were going to give out citations for that, the first one maybe has more moments like that than the the second one. But but um. Generally, I think if I use that stuff at all, I'm trying to find a moment where it works. You know, like I have one tune that I wrote where I kind of use one of those techniques like ad nauseum, but I wrote parts around it and that's how you execute the parts. So it's not really trying to be so aware of itself, but I also think it's not something that could be played without that, that technique. So maybe it's sort of like that. I don't know. But the idea was at the end of the day, it, it sounded musical enough for me to put it out. So I, I try not to let that stuff become like engines of creation. It's more just like, here's some stuff I learned how to do. But like at the end of the day, like even with like some of the crazy guitar players I've worked with, none of them want me to play that stuff <laughs> in their music. I mean, unless I have right. a moment, like it's a solo thing or something like, yeah, it, it's never really been. So it, it's kind of like, um, I don't really know what the analogy would be. Maybe it's like, like if, like if someone's a butcher, but they can also like swallow swords and juggle knives and stuff like wow. their job isn't really to do that, but, yeah. they, but they can, you know, they can. Yeah. You know? So I think, I don't, I couldn't think of a better example than that, but I think, no, no, you know no, what I'm I, saying? I get it. I get it. It makes sense. I yeah. would, for people that are listening, for the listeners um, that may be sort of going down that path of learning all these great new techniques, mm -hmm. but also trying to to find that middle ground where they're holding it down for somebody yeah. and they can actually get a gig because like you were just saying, you don't get hired as a bass player right now to do that a lot of the times. No. So um, how would you, what's some advice that you would give them to find that middle ground? Well, the one thing that I don't like in any artistic medium is the idea of putting ceiling or limitations on things. Cause I think no matter what, even if someone wants to explore, let's say like chords on bass, right? Like mm -hmm. I think there's a case to be made that sometimes chords on bass can sound really great. Um, now if you're in a band where you have two guitar players or a guitar player and a keyboard player, you're probably not going to need to play chords that much unless like there's an arrangement decision where maybe someone drops out for part of a verse and there's some bass chords. Like I think, but, but generally if we're going to just go by the history of how bass sounds and most recorded music, you're not going to use it a whole lot, but I don't think that at the end of the day, spending time on that stuff is, is time misspent because I think ultimately it's still going to give someone musical wherewithal to understand like maybe what a different instrument plays. Like if, you know, someone's like, well, I can play a sharp 11 chord, you know, on bass, or I know how to play like a few different uh, sus chords, like, like just being able to identify that sound just through practicing and learning some of those things, even though it's not necessarily going to be applicable on, on a gig. Um, I don't think that negates its value. And I think, I, agree. I think, yeah, yeah. I, and I, I think that's, that's the thing. I mean, I, I don't like a lot of the basis tropes because like the whole, like, you know, like Jock only needed four strings or like, you'll never <laughs> use that on your wedding band gig. I think a lot of those things are dangerous because I definitely, I think we're in a strange place now with this business where, and I don't mean because of COVID, I think you've got people that really just like playing stuff because they like songs and mm -hmm. that informs the way they play. And I think that's a valid way to play. But I think 
steering someone who's curious about music in one direction versus another because it leads to more security or some kind of like like uh, endless stream of work. I mean, I, I don't know if that's really the right motivation. I think it's more important to understand the advice is understand the context of how you think you'll be able to use it and understand that like as a hireable bass player, people may not want that from you. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't spend time on it. It just means that like if the hierarchy of needs is like, I want to work and I want to make money, then it's like that probably shouldn't be on the top. That shouldn't be your top card. But if the mindset is, Hey, I'm just trying to get good at music. Bass is my instrument. I want to dive into some different things. Then I would say the biggest thing is like, try to find the most musical way to use those things. So like with those techniques that involve lots of notes at once, like kind of like the, um, I, I kind of joke, I, I, this is not right to say this in, in, but I used to, I formally referred to those techniques as like AK 47 type <laughs> techniques because, you know, it's like just rounds and rounds of notes, yeah. but I'm not, you know, that's not really, there's other ways to say it. So let's just call them techniques that generate lots of notes with very little movement. I think, the real value in learning those to make them utilize, like to make them any kind of thing that someone could utilize. There's no shortcuts for practicing that stuff with like, like drum machines and, and like metronomes. Cause just to be able to get those things to groove and feel a certain way, which is possible. Like, I think it's important to do the, treat it like you're playing with one finger or two fingers or a pick or your thumb, like, like a, like just like a classic slap bass line. Like it's one of those things, like it mm -hmm. has to be, the rhythmic components have to be addressed like anything else. And I think that's why a lot of that stuff maybe gets frowned upon because some folks don't do that part. And so it doesn't, right. well, there, it suffers. Uh, there, there is a time and a place for everything. Um, mm -hmm. I think that knowing and being able to do those and use those techniques can help you in everything that you're doing while you're playing. I mean, like you were just saying, you're practicing with a metronome. You're mm -hmm. you're basically essentially playing the drums on the bass, which right. is only going to make you a better bass player. Right. So it's just figuring out, um, mostly listening <laughs> and knowing where you need to to place those things and use your voice. And Yeah. Uh, um, I agree with that. Let's talk about gear, dude. Yeah, sure. Um, Absolutely. What's your go-to bass? Um... Well, I would say, I would say like, like a lot of bass players, you know, I have like a couple Fenders. I have this Fender Getty Lee jazz bass that I got just off the shelf and I, I modif I've had it modified over the years and it's passive. I really like that bass a lot. Um, it tracks do you usually really well. Play, do you usually that? play passive? Are you, uh, do you prefer that over active? I think the way it worked for me, uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I do, um, I usually have pedals involved, and and I guess I always felt like passive basses um, played with certain types of stomp boxes in a in a more uh, natural way, because sometimes the preamp, you know, you're adding gain and stuff, or maybe you don't want gain, and it makes everything react differently. So, so I kind of got into this idea where. Um, you know, because I, I like active bases a lot and I have a, I have a few. And, but I think what I learned just from years of like trying to get more inside of wanting to duplicate sounds that I, I was happy with, I found that like if I like the way a bass sounds passively, um, then incorporating a preamp is only going to enhance that mm. versus like pickups that don't sound good and then you're using the preamp to cover up which is ultimately like a shitty pair of pickups or, you know, I, so <laughs> gotcha. I, I think that that is where my search, I guess the, the quest for tone, that's, that's what sort of started that whole thing. Like I, I, so, um, you know, in the way of like the, all the Fender bases I have, like I have two jazz bases and a P bass. Those are, those are, um, passive. And then, Another bass I use a lot, I have this five string that my friend Kevin Brubaker made for me. It's like a uh, like a signature bass. And it's essentially just a five string version of my Getty Lee jazz bass. You know, it's it's essentially a five string J bass. It's super even. Um, 
Kevin has a unique way of building the instruments. Like there's a, he has a thing that he, I guess he has a patent for it called the neck through. So it's essentially a bolt on neck and it goes further into the body. So huh. it kind of, it has similar attributes of, of like what a neck through does, but it still has like that, uh, that, that sort of bolt on thing that we all love so much. So that, that particular bass, I probably record it passive most of the time that has a pair of the Nordstrand Zen blades in it. It sounds like a really great seventies J bass. Then it's got an Aguilar preamp in there. And when I want to go active, I, I'll switch it on. But that's been like one of my favorite five strings. Um, Cause I never really had a five string jazz bass until that it was something I needed in the collection. That bass really kind of handles it beautifully. Um, I have a Strandberg Bowden bass, which is like a multi-scale headless thing. That thing sounds amazing. And it's it's chambered, so it's extremely light. And um, playing that instrument, it, it, it sort of just feels like the most futuristic thing in the world, but it's very ergonomic and it <laughs> sounds great. And uh, it I like using that bass a lot. It's also probably the most playable bass I have like so basically like if I don't know it, it's it's hard to explain but like my technique is like 20% better on that instrument on that I don't bass? know why it is huh. yeah because it's just so easy and effortless to play so if I'm like trying to really go like super uh I don't know man like if I'm just trying to go as hard as crazy as I can that's the bass I'll play it on um, okay I mean I can I can definitely like do that stuff on other instruments, but just the way it's set up, it's so easy to play. And it sounds, it's it not at the expense of like tone or, 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 uh, like, so that's your flash bass. That's my flash bass. And it looks, right. it looks cool, man. Like it, it definitely looks like it's from the future. Nice. Um, and then I have, uh, I have a couple bases on the East coast. One that I really love a lot. I'm going to bring out here is a, uh, a bass, built by my late great friend, uh, this guy, Tim Clunan. Uh, he, he had a company called Callow Hill and they made really amazing basses. He built me this short scale five, oh, which okay. sounds incredible. Um, and then, you know, I've just been working, I started working with Spectre a little bit and awesome. I have like, I have a Euro classic, which is, I guess, essentially like the five strings they made in the eighties. That bass sounds incredible. Um, I don't really know what to say about it other than it has like that, that's the, the quote unquote specter sound. Um, right. Which I, which I love. And, and it, it can just, you, can you uh, dive into that a little bit more? What the specter sound might be. So for some of the listeners, well, <laughs> excuse me. I think, you know, it's strange because again, like going back to being like a kid growing up in the eighties, like those were bases you'd see in videos. Like that was like a thing. Like I remember, watching the um, police synchronicity synchronicity concert and sting was playing like a white specter. And um, mm -hmm. then of course, you know, uh, other people were playing it. Like uh, I know, I know guy Pratt was using one on like this Madonna track he played on, like on like a prayer. And then later, you know, like I, I found out about like Doug Wimbish, you know, and his, his sound was like that. And, yeah. and um, I think the biggest thing, if, if it's someone, if someone's listening, who's like me is coming from like maybe more of a bolt on neck perspective. There's something about the neck through bass, which is new to me personally, where it's like, there's a certain amount of low end that's there and there's a certain amount of low mids that are there, but then there's also like a really, really, uh, it's just a really, really well balanced articulate sound, but okay. it's also really like powerful. You know, and yeah, for sure. I start. Yeah, I, th I think there were things that I didn't understand about how that bass worked in a recording setting until I started like kind of doing a deep dive and watching like documentaries. And like, I know, um, like, you know, I, I like a lot of metal stuff, too. I know Jason Newstead used the Spectre on the Black album. I know that was like a defining part of the way that album sounded like the mm -hmm. bass is really crisp every note's like huge sounding. It doesn't get lost in anything. And I also know that like Rex from Pantera, like all those records, yeah, um, yeah. he's using at least, you know, like some of the, 
like I think far beyond driven, he's playing like a, a, a specter on that. So there's, yeah. there's something about that, but it's like, it's weird how like for the funk and like heavier stuff, those bases just really, really have like something special, but, um, it cuts I don't, through. Yeah. Definitely. It's hard to sum up. I don't yeah. know. I'm not, yeah. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of describing it or not. You're doing great, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. I appreciate you. Um, okay. What about strings? Uh, I use Dunlops. I've been using the Super Brights since since they were beta testing them. Actually, awesome. Um, I use them too. Yeah, yeah. I um I dig them. I I really like the way they sound. I some of the bases I have the steels. Some of my bases I have nickel. Um, I don't know that I'm more loyal to one of those types of metals. Mm -hmm. Um, but I dig them. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i th there's a point where it's like you know it just drops off like i know what gauges i like and then it's like nickel or steel it's like i don't know like i just depends on whatever direction the wind blows that day gotcha. but um i came up with their hashtag for a while they're using this hashtag called turn on your brights ah that was that was my contribution to that that whole thing when it originally cool. came That's out it's very cool Right on, dude. Um, how about uh, effects? Well, effects that you know, I, I use I use some of the MXR stuff, and then I have um, like various things I've cherry picked over the years. Like I I was just kind of going through some stuff because there's always that thing where it's like if I don't use this for a couple years, should I sell it? And then I'll like think about it and it's like, nah, I shouldn't sell it. Um, so that so would I make you a hoarder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, you know, so I have like one of those old green deal for, uh, the line six, like that delay model. Oh, oh like, okay. Yeah. I, I like that one a lot, but, but more just as far as like what's on my board at any given time. Like I have an old OC two that I really like a lot. Um, like the boss, like classic octave pedal and mine actually, I don't know when this happened, but the red led got sheared off somehow. So I, I got, I had this guy, this guy, Matt from 30th street guitars in New York city. I had him put like a green led there. So I know if someone steals my pedal, like I know to, to say there's a green led on this thing. It's not red. Um, uh, that, is, but, that is wise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that thing, you know, that thing is, is kind of a tank. And, and, um, even though there's a lot of really good alternatives to that pedal now i still find myself really liking that i have some dark glass pedals i really like like i have the b3k i have one of the older right ones on. and then i have like the x7 which i really like a lot and um what else do i have for a while i was using the micropog for um lead stuff but i got sort of tired of it because it just seems to be a thing that everyone wants to use so I, I got away from it, but I did find some really interesting sounds that I liked that were pretty cool with it. And then, um, what else do I have? That's, that's basically it. Like I okay. got, you know, there, you know, I've got a bunch of different envelope filters. Um, is there something that, that, uh, is just like a constant, like this is, you know, when they hear you play, they they know you're going to use this. I, I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to do it every single time, but, right. you know, like, what do you have to have with you when you go to a session or, uh, uh, you know, go, go do a show? Yeah. You know, it's weird. I think I always want to have an octave pedal, even if I'm playing like a five string bass, not because I'd use it with the low B, but like, sometimes I like the, uh, I like what it does. And if I'm going to be doing anything with subs, sometimes I like that. Um, overdrive too. I think having some kind of an overdrive, even if it's not an overtly distorted, saturated sound, sometimes just to give it a little bit of extra dirt on the signal to help, you know, like, especially playing with subs, like that's one of the only ways to get in front of the kick drum sonically. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Tim LaFave actually taught me that when I was in New York. Um, it was like one of the few hints he just kind of randomly dropped to me once. He was like, yeah, you know, I use this overdrive pedal because it helps push that sound. Um, and it doesn't get lost between the kick drum and the other things going on. I never so, even, I hadn't even thought of it like that. Wow. That's, yeah. that's like, I am enlightened. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks to Tim, but that's, that kind of stuff is, is cool. I, I haven't really used 
a compressor pedal that much, but, but like, I'm, I've thought about maybe like starting to keep one around for certain things. Um, it's strange though, because my board right now is not, it's sort of like non-existent. Like I took it all apart and until we're all out playing again, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely know that, um, even though this isn't really an effect, the pedal tuner, like I have one of those, uh, um, the TC electronic polytune. Is that the strobe the, thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it, and it bypasses your signal when you're not, you right. know, when you're using, so I, I use yeah. that as a mute sometimes. I, I think of it as a mute switch that helps me stay in tune. That's how I, <laughs> that, that's a good way to think about it. What about yeah. amps, dude? Uh, I've been using Aguilar for okay. since like 2007 or no, 2005. Um, right on. So I've been using, like I have a, I have the Tone Hammer 700, which is a pretty dope head. And then I have one of the, one of the SL 410s, but amps are strange. Cause there's a lot of them that I like, man. Yeah. But, but I've been in an Aguilar endorser for, for, I guess, math, I think 16 years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's, we are just grateful people. Absolutely, do, man. They're, they're such did. good it's dudes. Yeah. And, um, you know, they've always been great to me. And, you know, I, I like, I kind of like where their stuff falls in the range of the tonal stuff that they, they offer, you know, like it's sort of like a, they have one foot in the classic sound and one foot in the modern sound. So I, I like that a lot that it helps me kind of, it, it sort of complements the wheelhouse I tend to operate within. So I dig that. Right on, man. How do you what what still challenges you is musically? What do you what do you practice? I still try to think about playing things that I hear in real time, you know. And and I try to I want I want I always want my ears to have more power than my hands. Uh, Even though like you know, we all need our hands to be able to respond and stuff. Yeah. So I, I try to think about that more. Um I don't know. It's like there's there's things that I, I've constantly worked on since, you know, since like getting into certain types of music. Like I still practice standards and, and songs that have harmonically challenging things, but I don't, it's not really to like throw the gauntlet down and say, Hey, I can play this tune. It's more just, it gives my brain and my ears something to think about. Um, but then the other, the other thing is I've been practicing a lot of guitar too. So oh, cool. Have you been, been writing? Working, have you been uh, writing a lot? Staying creative and writing? Yeah, I've been writing. Um, I've been working on like different voicings. Uh, I've been working on my picking, which has been helping my bass picking. Um, Very cool. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I try to work on though is like, it, it's mostly just trying to like realize my ideas, you know? And it's like, if I hear something, it's like, okay, how can I flesh this out. You know, how can I, how can I make this work a certain way? I mean, cause I, I definitely will spend time at least five times out of the seven days a week, just maintaining things that my hands can do, but I don't spend like eight hours a day on technique anymore. Like I, yeah. that's why I think letting my ears steer the, steer the ship creates a lot of challenges. Cause sometimes I hear stuff I can't, play like right or or i'll hear something that's not really part of what my vocabulary is and i'll want to understand what it, what it is i'm trying to achieve with it so so that's that's kind of what what keeps me engaged and then i always leave time to improvise uh, every day i like to give myself some kind of a guided way to improvise um i do the same thing huh i do the same thing yeah yeah i and i think um there's a guitar player that that I'm really um, a big fan of, and he's kind of a friend too. This guy Wayne Krantz. Wayne has a really cool way that he practices improvisation, where he limits. He might create like some chord changes, and he might limit where he plays on the on the neck of the guitar. Like he might pick like a five fret um, area and not deviate from that. So what that does is it it really robs him of the ability sometimes depending on where that five frets are you can't rely on the shapes you have to use your ear and you right. have to you have to play with more intention so i think that is something 
that I, that I try to make sure I'm making myself do because, you know, otherwise I feel like I get stagnant. You know, I like to be, I like to create situations where maybe like my ideas get stifled or, you know, I'm not, it's not going to be killing all the time, but at least I'm in that moment and I'm doing something. Um, and then, you know, sometimes I'll transcribe, like I'll try to learn bass lines. Like I always wanted to learn or guitar lines. Like I got through the first half of Van Halen one on guitar. Oh, like, wow. I'm, Cause I've been, you know, Good like one. working on a lot of that stuff. Yeah, so that's cool. You know, I don't know, man, that's, nice. that's kind of, well, the, all these things are, are part of just, um, um, honing in on your craft and, and on your journey to becoming a well-rounded musician, I think um, yeah. they're all important. Yeah. yeah. You know, what do you challenge. do? Like what's, what's your, man. what's your, uh, cause you know, you've, you've done a lot of different types of gigs. Like, do you ever find that like stuff that you did a lot when you were infectious grooves? Well, so, you know, does that, do you maintain that kind of stuff or do you sort of like, I try to, well, you know, obviously the stuff that I was doing in infectious grooves and suicidal, I'm not going to use in a lot of some of the other gigs that I've right. done or I'm doing. But I do like to just kind of go back and go over certain techniques and just jam out. That's what, one of the reasons why I do the Instagram stuff is just so I can kind of free my mind and my hands and my creativity with no rules, no expectations, and just jam out, create things that, you know, I don't, you wouldn't necessarily probably do when you go in to do a session like, on, you know, for right. someone else, but I'm free to do it myself because this is my Instagram and I can damn it. (laughs) But, um, yeah, man. Um, I try to challenge myself, um, whether it be, um, creating interesting, um, lines that kind of make you move or with effects, you know, I just really try to come up with three different things a day, every single day. Yeah. And I've been, you know, producing a lot of tracks too. Um, so just building all of that stuff together has really helped, especially this last year. It's helped right. me as a, as a musician completely. Yeah. But, um, um, all right. There's this, this or that thing that we do on here sometimes. And it's just uh, rapid fire questions. Oh, great. I love are, rapid Are you fire. ready? All right. Yeah. Here we go. Text or call? Call. Active or passive, which we already discussed, but I'll let you throw it out there again. Um, passive, uh, beach hut or cabin beach hut, Jameson or Jocko. Oh, that's hard, man. <laughs> Damn. That's, that's tough. You can't say both, right? That's a cop out. Well, you can, I, I would say both. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Yes, sir. We got to talk yeah. about coffee that, you know what, right mm-hmm. now for this, uh, Last three minutes, this is going to be bass and brews because I'm drinking cold brew and I don't know what you're drinking, but cheers to that. Yeah, I, I'm drinking. Um, well, I, I bought I have a couple different beans that I that I got uh, I'm, today. I'm using um, Intelligentsia. It's uh, El Diablo, which is sort of a dark roast. And um, basically, yeah, I, I have an AeroPress and I have a grinder. So I just grind it up and brew it like a cup it's like a cup at a time kind of thing but oh you get you know you're getting fan, fancy <laughs> you know what <laughs> yeah like i i try to go out once a day and get coffee somewhere else but like i i think i take pride in like trying to make good coffee for myself or you know whoever might be here and so yeah. I've, it's just been like a rabbit hole of like trying to figure out what's the right temperature for the water, you know, and like, Oh, we got to have the, a conversation on that later on. We're talking, yeah, we I'm, gotta dig I'm not an that. expert, but I've, I've learned a few things. Right on, man. Um, can you let our listeners know where they can find you? Social media, any music you got up? There's my website, stevejenkinsbass.com. That's probably like the best hub type situation that, that, um, has all the links, but, but Instagram, it's probably the best place to go. Also, there's also links there. Uh, that's at Steve Jenkins on Instagram. And then I got my music is on Bandcamp. Uh, I have like two records and I put out a single uh, like a month and a half ago. Um, awesome. So all that stuff's there. What's the name of it? Uh, the name of the single or the name of the... The name of the single. The name of the single is Mecca. Oh, and cool. it's basically just, it's about a giant robot hawk. Well, <laughs> there's a video. That's awesome. Yeah, there's that a is video awesome. on uh, on YouTube and stuff. Yeah, right on. Uh, where uh, is there a name for the Bandcamp link or 
Oh, that's just Steve Jenkins, uh, period Bandcamp. Oh, it's like, sorry, period. What, what century are we in? Steve Jenkins dot Bandcamp dot com. <laughs> You're awesome. Oh, man. Uh, that's our show for today. I thank you for joining us. Stay healthy and kind. Spread love and good vibes and inspiration. And remember, you got this. Follow your path and just play. I am Josh Paul, and I hope to see you out there sometime soon. Thanks again to Dunlop for making this show possible. And uh, be sure to check out Bass Freaks wherever you get your podcasts. All right, everybody. Cheers.